Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to our last session for the day. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And I hope you enjoyed the talk so far as much as I have. Um, just a really quick reminder for um, for today, just to check out the our partners at the booths um, for a chance to win some amazing prizes. Prizes um, last time. Uh, they were giving out $100 Amazon gift cards and Sono speakers, so definitely check them out. Uh, now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Graham Taylor. Uh, Graham is a Canadian uh, Canada Chair, Research Chair, and Associate Professor of Engineering at the University of Guelph. He co-directed the University of Guelph Center for Advanced Responsible and Ethical AI and is a member of the Vector Institute for AI. He is a he has co-organized organized the annual CIFAR Deep Learning Summer School and trained more than 70 students and researchers on AI-related projects. In 2016, he was named as one of the 18 inaugural CIFAR Azrael Global Scholars. In 2018, he was honored as one of Canada's top 40 under 40. And in 2019, he was named a Canada CIFAR AI Chair. He spent 2018 and 2019 as a visiting, visiting faculty member at Google Brain in Montreal. Graham also co-founded Kindred, which was featured at number 29 on MIT Technology Review's 2017 list of smartest companies in the world. And he is the academic director of Next AI, a nonprofit accelerator for AI-focused entrepreneurs. Graham will be giving us a talk today about machine learning in One Health, Please give a warm welcome in chat to Graham Taylor. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Peter. Okay, I'm going to put my slides now into full screen. All right, perfect. I, I won't see you guys for a little bit, but I, I did check out the participants list already, and it's great to see some colleagues from Vector, uh, some friends and acquaintances through the Next AI program, uh, and... Uh, yeah, also like former former students and postdocs in the audience. So it's great. Thank you for attending. I'd like to take a little bit of a different spin on machine learning for health today. As you saw in my title and I guess also my abstract, which was, which was briefly on the screen, um, it, it's not just about human health. Uh, a lot of the presentations have been about human health today, but I'm going to talk to you about human health, but also health uh, for uh non-human animals and also uh, health of the planet. So I, I know that Vector uh, and, and some of our Vector colleagues here are really supportive of today's symposium. Vector is a sponsor and you would have heard uh, Manal open up with some comments from Vector. So I won't tell you anything more about Vector, though Vector does play a role in everything I'll be talking about today. I wanted to highlight a couple uh, institutions at the University of Guelph that I'm involved in. And one of them uh, is a relatively new center, which we launched in 2018. And that was launched in response to rising uncertainty and apprehension around the long-term effects on our economy, our health, and our society at large. And that is the Guelph Center for Advancing Responsible and Ethical AI, or CARE AI for short. And I co-direct this center with Professor Gus Scoreborg in the Department of Philosophy. And the center honors Guelph's rich history in research that improves life and community-engaged scholarship and its growing efforts and strengths in fundamental and applied AI. So what sets CARE AI apart from other national and international AI centers is that it integrates ethics and governance expertise with technical leadership. And these groups are regularly interacting to ensure that new autonomous platforms are safe and benefit humanity. So CARE AI is really structured around three pillars you see here uh, in the three words. So methodology, responsibility, and applications. And we've affiliated more than 30 faculty working in at least one of these areas. Our mission at CARE AI is to advance multidisciplinary AI training and research and its responsible application to improve life. And I just wanted to point out that improve life is the simple yet elegant uh, tagline of the University of Guelph. One of our achievements so far is a popular collaborative specialization in artificial intelligence master's program. And this has courses co-taught 
between engineering, computer science, mathematics, and philosophy. And it was designated as one of the original 10, now there's more than 20, uh, recognized master's programs by Vectors Ray's initiative. And many of the students in the program are supported by Vector Scholarships in AI and pursuing projects funded by Care AI and the One Health Institute uh, seed funds. So what is the One Health Institute? It's another organization I am involved in a little bit less directly than I am with Care AI, uh, but I am an affiliated faculty with One Health at uh, Guelph. And as many of you know, University of Guelph has roots in veterinary medicine and food production. So the researchers at U of G have long understood the close relationship between the health of plants, animals, people, and the land that supports them. And One Health is a collaborative effort of multiple disciplines working together on our planet's most complex animal, human, and environmental health problems. And so the way I've structured my talk today is I'm going to align one project with each of Care AI's key pillars. And so the first pillar I mentioned was AI methodology. And being a very technical person with a computer science and engineering background, this is where I would say I mostly align my own research interests. And most of the work in my lab is taking, taking place within the methodology space. And I chose to highlight a project related to histopathology because my vector colleague, Anne Martel, just gave a talk. Uh, and I, I was kind of silly about this. Like I thought that she would have introduced it uh, and I wouldn't need to give any further introduction, introduction. But then I realized today when I was looking over the schedule, it's a parallel track session. So I know that some of you will have attended uh, Dr. Martel's talk. Some of you uh, will have not attended it because maybe you chose another session. Uh, so I still will give a very brief uh, introduction to ML for histopathology. So what you would have heard if you attended uh, Dr. Martel's talk was that uh, these whole slide images uh, that are uh, produced in this, in this domain are extremely large. So, you know, if you fooled around with machine learning, you would have seen like MNIST and CIFAR, which are 28 by 28 and 32 by 32 pixel images, respectively. Whole slide images, we're talking about 100K by 100K. And so this, uh, the, the scale of these images makes data annotation by pathologists very expensive and time consuming. And due to these factors, limited label data are available, uh, despite the fact that there are very large repositories, uh, digital archives of these whole slide images. And so we would like to exploit machine learning and one path forward is transfer learning. So wherever you have a lack of labeled data, transfer learning is a popular technique. And the idea behind transfer learning is that you can learn low level features by pre-training on data, often from different domains. So for example, natural images. And this technique has been shown uh, by Anne Martel and other people uh, in the field that it, it is, can be very effective in histopathology and other medical imaging data sets. And what I wanna talk about specifically is a flavor of transfer learning called self-supervised learning. And this is where the model is pre-trained on an alternative task using unlabeled data from the same domain. So the, the way to succinctly describe this is you create a supervised learning problem where you don't actually need any human annotated uh, data. So in self-supervised learning, what you need to do is create this auxiliary task, which we often call a pretext task, and have these labels be generated algorithmically with no human intervention. I will show you a couple examples of that shortly. So how does self-supervised learning work? It happens in three stages. So the first stage, is you undergo this pretext task. You initialize a model, often a CNN, uh, though visual uh, transformers are becoming popular these days, to complete one of these pretext tasks using unlabeled data. Stage two is now initializing your target model, often a CNN, using the weights from stage one uh, and fine tuning it using limited labeled data for your target task. So if you're interested in um, predicting cancers versus not cancerous. This is where you'd be training with respect to that classification task. And then the, thir the third and final stage is evaluation where you actually roll the model out 
uh, on unseen data and now uh, evaluate its performance or you de deploy the model. And so while it's popular to use a large labeled data set of natural images, such as ImageNet, the impacts of cross-domain pre-training are really poorly understood, whether, whether it's self-supervised learning or it's transfer learning in general. So specifically, if we look at research within the medical imaging domain, some research studies have shown that domain-specific data for pre-training improves performance, whereas others have found the opposite, that using embeddings from non-medical image data sets, uh, such as natural images or textures, provides higher performance. So there really are contradictory results. And additionally, very few evaluations that have actually been completed in histopathology. Furthermore, little research has been conducted into what composition of the source data sets uh, used for self-supervised learning uh, would result in better performance. So our objective in this work is to look at whether using source data from different domains for simple self-supervised learning pretext tasks can provide a superior initialization for digital histopathology. So let me briefly describe the experimental setup. So we take a two-stage approach. In the first stage, we subsample 4,000 images from a single source data set. And then we embed these images into a fe pre-trained feature embedding. In this, uh, it's an Inception V3 feature space for those of you who know what uh, that model is. And so in that space, we compute uh, just a simple uh, Gaussian model and compute log likelihood. And um, we compute the average of that over the data set. So this is a metric for data set diversity we established in a recent paper on instance selection with Terence DeVries. And so this gives us a, a number effectively that represents uh, the diversity, uh, which is the negative of the log likelihood score of that simple Gaussian model fitted to feature space. And so uh, after computing the diversity of the data set, we train a model using one of the self-supervised learning tasks. So we use rotation or jigsaw tasks, uh, and I'll show you those in a second. And then in the second stage, we initialize models one of three ways. So we either use the SSL pre-training, which I just described using the jigsaw or the rotation task. We initialize the rates, the weights as random or we use uh, ImageNet uh, pre-training using the class labels in ImageNet, which is another popular form of transfer learning. And so then we fine tune these models that have been initialized in these different ways with a subset of target data, either a really small subset with a hundred label data points or a slightly larger one with a thousand data points. And uh, for the target, we always use the patch chameleon uh, histopathology data set. And for our source, what we're interested in is comparing the diversity of these different sources. So we have four different sources, two of them, uh, which are, uh, one's, one's a natural image data set, tiny image net. One is a, a library of textures called a lot. And then we have two medical imaging related data sets, PCAM and uh, the colorectal cancer data set. So let me just briefly review the pretext tests. Uh, for those of you who know self-supervised learning already, you're probably familiar with these two because they're so popular. Uh, the rotation task effectively selects uh, four different rotations here and applies them to the original images. And so the task becomes, can you predict uh, the rotation? So it's just a four-way classification uh, problem. And so the, the model is forced to perform this task and, and develops features that are then used for stage two. Uh, the jigsaw task is a little bit more complicated. Here we take an original image, we split it up into nine tiles, and then we create a hundred different permutations of those tiles. And so we still have a classification problem because we're trying to uh, predict uh, which of the jumblings have occurred. Uh, and uh, again, this is used as self-supervised learning pre-training. So you can see how we've created effectively a classification problem, uh, but we have synthetic labels because we've created the problem ourselves. Okay, so that's the classification problem. And so let's go on to see how the changes in data set uh, composition and the uh, change in self-supervised learning pretext uh, task affect the results. 
So first of all, we found that the performance of the Jigsaw pre-trained models for all source data sets were comparable or exceeded networks pre-trained with ImageNet classification and with random initialization. So ImageNet is often a very strong transfer learning baseline. Um, the only thing we found that was negative with respect to uh, self-supervised learning here is that in the lowest data regime for the rotation pre-trained model, um, that was outperformed by ImageNet. So the jigsaw task is more sophisticated and we're recommending one go with that over rotation. The other interesting uh, finding we had was that the colorectal cancer data set, which exhibited the lowest average log likelihood, and that's the highest diversity, as you can see in the first column, was found to be a top ranking initialization for all the data regimes. So um, with the exception here of the rotational initialized model, fine-tuned with 100 examples, the model that we saw uh, underperformed earlier. And so because CRC typically outperformed pre-training with PCAM, it suggests that pre-training with a more diverse set of histology images may be beneficial from a pre-training perspective. The other thing we looked at was the uh, the correlation between data set diversity represented by this lower log likelihood score and target test accuracy. And so for all conditions, except for rotation uh, self-supervision, we uh, with the thousand labels, we saw a positive correlation between diversity and target text accuracy. So our key findings from this was that using source data from different domains, can provide comparable or superior initializations. Diversity and model performance were correlated. Uh, selecting more diverse source data may improve target performance in low data conditions, particularly. And diverse histopathology data sets for SSL pre-training might show the greatest promise. And so what we're working on now is examining different SSL pretext tasks that are much more uh, sophisticated than jigsaw and rotation. Dr. Martel actually pointed out a couple of those uh, in her talk. Uh, ones that particularly of interest are ones that are uh, not domain specific. So these techniques that can work not just on images, but on other kinds of data. And we're also interested in investigating the effect of combining data sets in a systematic way. So can we combine data sets to improve the diversity uh, and see if that has a positive effect on representation learning with self-supervision. Okay, so next I wanna talk about some responsibility projects. And the project I wanted to highlight was uh, work on machine learning for mental health. So access to mental health uh, care in Canada was limited even before the emergence of COVID-19. And research has suggested that a third of individuals have felt their mental health needs were not uh, currently being met. And additionally, 34% of individuals' first mental health service contact was through the emergency department. During the pandemic, we've seen that machine learning-based forecasting has allowed for proactive resource allocation. So you may have seen these efforts in uh, predicting hospital uh, bed usage or ICA, ACU bed usage. Uh, and, and this has been extremely beneficial. Yet, we still see very limited applications of machine learning based forecasting in mental health. And what we have found is that in order to responsibly develop these sorts of models, it's very, nece very much necessary to understand the domain specific challenges that exist. So it, the objective of this work that we're presenting at the machine learning uh, or sort of the computational approaches for mental health workshop at ICML uh, this weekend coming up. It's uh, work that highlights these challenges and justifies a human-centered solution. So what are the primary challenges here? Uh, we've identified four key challenges. One is data quality and access. So this refers to the limit availability, limited availability of high quality data and the challenges associated with collecting this data. The second challenge is that the, is the more qualitative nature of the mental health diagnostic workflow when compared to other health data. So this, this particular domain of health is not as 
directly instrumented as other uh, health uh, disciplines. Fairness and ethical concerns, uh, including concepts such as diverse representation of data sets and data collection considerations are certainly a concern here as in other areas of health. And finally, something we discuss in this work is a lack of end user trust in AI decision-making tools. So we hypothesize that this might be due to the large translation gap that exists between the theoretical research uh, that we do and clinical practice uh, and decision-making in, in the mental health field. So to address this translation gap, we suggested that machine learning practitioners should consider applying human-centered AI and human-centered AI or HCAI is a user-centered design approach to developing AI algorithms. And that depends uh, on interdisciplinary collaboration with domain experts. So some of the major benefits of pursuing HCI, HCAI include by engaging with domain experts, uh, ML practitioners can build user trust and help to ensure the solution aligns with user expectations. Secondly, this engagement also helps understand the real world context of how the system will be integrated. HCI often advocates for a mixed method approach, which can help to fill gaps where data is missing, address contextual fairness issues, and build on techniques used in other fields. And finally, HCI promotes the use of explainable models that can address interpretability challenges, and it highlights the necessity to understand, understand risks of incorrect predictions. So one of the projects that uh, embodies the spirit of uh, the ICML work is a collaboration I've done recently with uh, researchers at the Kremble Center for Neuroinformatics at CAMH. And this work uh, leverages a cross-sectional survey administered in six waves between May and December 2020. So there's a total sample, sample size of about 6,000 individuals, and it collects demographic characteristics, socioeconomic status, mood, substance use behaviors, and changes in employment or fears due to COVID-19. And what we've done is we've collapsed seven items collected from a generalized anxiety disorder survey and two items from the Center for Epidemiologic, Epidemiologic Studies Depression Scale to a single principal component, which we call the distress index. We've effectively captured um, nine qualitative variables and isolated a single uh, principal component of those, which we call uh, distress. And then we take these other features that we've collected and attempt to regress to this distress variable. And uh, we're not merely interested in predictive performance, we're interested in interpretability. So we use what's called a, a SHAP analysis to explore which features are most predictive of distress. And that's what you see in this, this plot here. And so here we see the three most important items uh, that are predicting elevated emotional distress are increased worries about finances, worries about getting COVID-19 and a younger age. And in, in this work, we also explore interactions between the different variables. The work on uh, forecasting, which is where, what we're currently carrying out uh, with PhD student Christina Cooperschmidt is still in development, uh, but we're leveraging a, a, a very large data set called the Connects data which results in, in help phone calls uh, uh, related to mental health. Uh, and that will be uh, available soon to, to share. Okay, so the final uh, part of my presentation is on the AI application side. And what I wanted to uh, talk about uh, starts with the World Economic Forum uh, Top Global Risks Report. So they launch this report each year and when the WF first launched the Global Risk Perception Survey in 2006, economic factors uh, filled most of the top spots by likelihood and impact. And I was astounded in 2020 when I saw this report, just pre-COVID, all five of the top risks by likelihood, as you can see here in green, are environmental. Okay, so there um, three of them are climate related. And never before has one issue dominated the survey in this way, not even through uh, the 2008 to 2009 financial crisis. So even post COVID, as you see here in the 2021 report, environmental risks still dominate by likelihood and impact. We, of course, you can see uh, the infectious diseases there, uh, again, on top global risks, but there's an overwhelming amount of green 
and in particular, biodiversity loss is staggering. So as many as 1 million species face extinction in the next se several decades, with biodiversity loss a major factor. And DNA barcoding is groundbreaking technique developed at the University of Guelph and used to identify the diversity of species in our ecosystem based on their DNA. Barcoding has revolutionized biodiversity efforts in the past 10 years, but it requires a physical specimen to work. And so what I'm doing is collaborating with the team who developed DNA barcoding to apply computer vision to improve the robustness and scale of species detection. And so this technology has the potential to give researchers and citizen scientists the ability to identify tens of thousands of species within seconds. So what I'm showing you here is a picture from Bioscan, which is a global interdisciplinary research effort to build an earth observation system for biodiversity. And this project will incorporate both DNA and vision-based analysis. I wanna save some time for questions. I had a few other things to show you specifically, but effectively where we're at right now is that we can uh, do counting of individual species to 20 uh, functional groups at the moment. We can do this in the lab, as you see on the left, uh, in this uh, mixed plate image, and we have scaled this to sort of more in the wild settings, as you can see uh, in this sheet on the right. And there's many ways of doing this. You can do this via classification or detection, or you can do it as a regression problem. Uh, you can do it with a, um, just um, point type supervision. So there's a really interesting thing about counting is you can set it up in many different ways. And so I think the, the last thought I will leave you with is some learnings from the startup community. Uh, it's always been said that deep learning has this data problem and we know that algorithms are commoditized. We push work out there on a methodology, from a methodology standpoint, directly to archive. We're, we're very good as a community in releasing open source code. And the first mover advantage in the startup community has been uh, based on access to proprietary data. And I'm drawing here from Ingmar Posner, who, who gave a very short presentation at the Creative Destruction Lab a few weeks ago. He is saying that this first mover advantage is gone. And um, he's arguing that this has changed because of two phenomena. One is system level self-supervision, which is something I talked about. Examples of this are in autonomous driving, AlphaGo is another known example. And the other phenomena is synthetic data, um, either by simulators or generative models. So I didn't really talk too much about generative models, but this is something we're very keen on in the lab. And so from a One Health perspective, I think both self-supervision and representation learning and generative models uh, to attack this data problem are gonna be increasingly important. So I'll stop and thank uh, the two students, or the student postdoc who contributed the majority of the technical work here as well as numerous collaborators uh, and the funders of our group. So my website's there if you'd like more information about these projects. And there's also the CARE AI website if you'd like to learn more about the center. Thanks a lot for your attention and I'm happy to take a couple questions. Yeah, thank you, Graham, for the amazing talk. We have a couple questions. Um, the first one is related to uh, the AI responsibility talk about um, uh, AI, uh, machine learning, and mental health. Um, what do you think about the application of chatbots in uh, mental health? Yeah, so I, I, this this is interesting. I remember seeing many years ago, I would say at least five years ago, some work out of um, University of Southern California on chatbots, which actually had a visual component too. It's almost like a, a virtual uh, psychologist that would interact with individuals. And that research showed uh, quite striking effects of uh, people who are normally isolated being able to engage with a, a virtual human. I have really not done any work in that space myself. I don't do a lot of NLP work. Uh, I worked with a lot of teams in Next AI who do NLP based work, particularly in chatbots. And uh, my colleague in philosophy, Gus Gorborg, uh, has actually investigated some of those technologies. So all I can say is that you know, I have seen very interesting projects. Um, and it, it seems like a worthwhile uh, direction to go, with, particularly with personalization of chatbot services, but I know very little about that very specific domain. I I'm, <laughs> usually work with pixels, as you saw in my presentation today. I see, yeah. Um, I, I guess a little further uh, a bit about, um, so one of the, the projects that you worked on was to basically take um, 
various features and correlate that to a to uh, the, a distress score. Um, Correct. So there are survey responses um, okay. on basically qualitative responses on a Likert scale, uh, one to seven of how people felt about a particular element of stress in their life. And there were kind of nine of these qualitative questions. Mm -hmm. And then we boiled those down to a single numerical uh, score. Um, so later on, you guys did take other features and try to correlate it to that score as well. That's our target variable. Yeah, so that, so that one uh, numerical measure of distress, which we called it, um, that was our target, like our Y. And then we also had about 50 variables that were the, like the, the vector X uh, that were also survey responses. And some of them were categorical variables, some of them were numerical, uh, and, and those were used. And I didn't really talk too much about the method, but it was an XGBoost regressor that went from those 50 variables uh, to that one measure of uh, COVID-19 related distress. Um, and what I was showing you there in that SHAP analysis is the importance of each of those input variables on uh, being able to pre predict COVID related uh, distress. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, our next question about that is, is um, distress pre a predictor for, um, I guess, vaccination or intent to for vaccination? Is that something you guys looked at? Uh, that's interesting. So the survey uh, is, is was collected by this organization uh, called uh, Delvinia Research, and uh, that was done in collaboration with CAMH. I was a collaborator in the analysis and not involved with the data set collection. To the best of my knowledge, uh, there were no questions related to vaccination. This was May to December uh, 2020. Um, I'm not 100% certain of that, but I don't recall encountering any variables uh, related to vaccination. So uh, to Sivi's question there, um, we didn't look at um, any relationship between stress and vaccination, but it's, it's, it's certainly a very interesting uh, question. I just don't think it's in that particular survey data. I see. Okay. Um, and our, our next question would um, ask more about um, the data set diversity in the his solid histological um, image and the pre-training of it. Um, what what is what do you mean by the data set diversity? What what does it look yeah, like? Yeah, I, I went over that kind of quickly. So the details of that are in a, a paper called Instance Selection for GANs. GANs being generative adversarial networks, done by Terence DeVries, who who didn't actually ask the question knows is a student in the group, and um, that was a totally different. Uh, paper not related to health data at all, but that paper basically looked at generative models and whether you could prune your data set. Because so you always think more data is, is, is the best thing you can do. Just get more data and things will work better in machine learning. That kind of is the mantra. But in that paper, we show this surprising effect that it's actually for GAN training a good idea to prune some of your data set. Because GANs, given their current state of uh, being or their, their, their functionality, they struggle to represent uh, very uh, sparse part, parts of the manifold. Okay, so imagine if you have a lot of data sort of concentrated uh, and that accurately represents the manifold, the, the, the GAN will, can generate that quite well. But in parts of the manifold that are kind of sparse and unusual, the GANs struggle to produce that. So the idea is like, why waste all your capacity trying to model that data if you're just going to do poorly on it? And a lot of methods use things like rejection sampling, um, to sort of eliminate that data after you've trained the GAN. So it's like you're wasting all this computation to try to model these things that you're just going to reject at generation time anyways. So what we did was we perp repurposed that um, work for diversity. And so what we do in, to sort of prune the data set in instant selection is we fit a very s simple likelihood model to uh, features of the data. So take all the images, we run them through, say, an inception net, and get a vector for each of those images. So that's sort of an embedding of each image. And then we train a, a, like a Gaussian likelihood model. We do a few different things in the instance selection paper, but what we did for histology was a Gaussian likelihood model on those embeddings. And so now what we can do is measure the likelihood of a, the whole held out set of that data set. And if you know that data set has high likelihood score, then we say that's not a very diverse data set. A, a diverse data set will have an average likelihood that's lower because it's sort of spread out um, and less con less concentrated. And so um, that's kind of the sort of intuitive sense of how it works. Lower likelihood uh, under a simple like unimodal Gaussian model 
uh, means a, a higher diversity, uh, a more diverse data set. It's just a simple metric, and other ones could also be investigated as well. I see. All right, that, that's very fascinating. Um, and and I, I guess uh, a bit of a question about how that can be used at inference for, um, do you guys, have you guys done any uh, tests with non-human uh, histopathological images as well to uh, use it for any sort of application there? Oh, that, that's interesting. So my colleagues in the vet school at Guelph are very interested in uh, that kind of analysis. Um, maybe that's what you're thinking of non-human, or maybe you're thinking of sort of um, microbes. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, no, I, so I haven't done any uh, histopathological analysis on any uh, non-human data yet, but there's certainly many people that would be interested, um, I'm sure, in the work that's coming out of that we're, that we're doing or uh, out of Anne's lab or also uh, Hamid Tazush who talked today, who's also an expert on his pathology. There's been a lot of breakthroughs there that have not yet been ported over to non-animal uh, data. And uh, I, I guess on that note, in terms of um, the pre-training, you guys did have histological, um, a data set of histology um, images, right? For one of the pre-training data sets? Yeah, yeah. So what we found, we had two, we had PCAM <laughs> and we had CRC and we had four data sets in total. So we also had tiny image net and, and this thing called a lot, the textures data set. Mm -hmm. And we did notice a small advantage of the CRC data set, which was both in domain. So it was actually a histopathology data set used for pre-training and it was more diverse than PCAM. So again, we didn't test a ton of data sets. It's, it's kind of preliminary work. This is just a short paper that appears at MIDL this year. And we're working to expand that study. Um, but we do have some evidence in, a, in a, a small way at this point that domain specific pre-training using histological data and also diversity is, is beneficial for uh, self-supervision. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess that kind of goes back to my initial question was, what is it with most of the training data was probably human uh, histological data uh, image, right? Because that's probably what we have uh, most of, right? Okay, so I understand where you're going. Yes, <laughs> it's all it's all human. So that's also something we can investigate, right? Like st sticking with histopathology, but um, gaining access to non-human data. And also that's one of the areas I said, I'd like to go into sort of um, combining data sets. We only looked at one data set for pre-training at a time and it's diversity, but how can you, there's questions like, how can you maximize the diversity of your data sets, your overall pre-training data set when you have access to multiple data sources? Um, it seems to be common in there about like mice data, right? Like you can get access to a lot of different um, uh, histopathology type data. That's true. Yeah, I, I totally forgot all of mice data. That's probably one of the larger pool as well, even more so than I guess human. Um, yeah, that, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, I, I'd be very interested in seeing any um, how that data set works as a once, even as like a zero shot class class i think i guess you wouldn't be able to do like a zero shot uh like fine tuning on a classification on human data set um for a certain sort of classification and then um for the pre-trained on all human or mostly human um histopathological data how would it do for i guess different species and whether like that in domain specificness specificity actually affects um its performance right and then vice versa, uh, if you have a more diverse data set, would that make human histological um, images better? The, the cross-species stuff is very interesting. And I, I, I think I've only encountered one paper that, that does this. It, it's very rare to see these, these efforts, but particularly in computer vision. So yeah, certainly of interest to, to us, but something we really haven't investigated. Well, uh, I think that should be all in the, for the questions. Um, this was an amazing talk and thank you again for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks everybody for the great questions, uh, their engagement and the kind words I'm seeing in the chat. So I really appreciate it and uh, all the best everybody. Have a great rest of the week. Thank you.